do that. Three. All right, number three, expanding eligibility for parole release. So this is um, building on uh, what we heard from Jennifer Schaefer, the uh, head of uh, BPH, when she spoke to the committee in July. So right now, people who are serving a nonviolent sentence, a sentence for a nonviolent offense, are able to be reviewed for parole uh, and released after they serve, and it gets a little legal lingo, unfortunately, the full term for their primary offense. What that means is that enhancements don't count, consecutive sentences don't, don't count. They, it's the sort of uh, longest base term, and I shouldn't even say that, the, the longest term of, uh, you know, that you've been sentenced to uh, in court. So it's, um, it's, it's a way to just do all the things that a little indeterminacy can do, which is to encourage, uh, you know, appropriate behavior, encourage rehabilitation, encourage programming, and, and those sorts of things that uh, the prison system can do sometimes. So the proposal will be to say, well, let's remove this nonviolent uh, characterization and just say anyone who's in prison uh, serving one, um, a, a, a sentence after they've done the term for the primary offense should be available for review and, and possible release. And the outcome here would obviously be to safely increase the uh, number of people who are doing shorter sentences. So we can talk a little bit about what um, this, how this might work. So this graph here needs a little bit of explanation, but I think I can do it quickly. So the non the current nonviolent parole review process that was created by Prop 57 was based on a process that was created by the federal court overseeing the um, prison uh, overcrowding cases. Judge Henderson, for example, I think would be able to tell us a lot about this where he here today. And so, but that process originally only applied to this nonviolent second striker population. They were eligible after they, they had done half their sentence. So they got the benefit of not having that doubled sentence. And when uh, BPH first started doing this in 2015, you can see the grant rates are, are very high. The blue is the court process. The red is the Prop 57 process. So you can see uh, in those early days of the court process, it was over 50% the grant rate. And I think uh, one explanation you hear for this here is that uh, there was a lot of people who had been, who were overdue for this kind of review, because this is the first time anyone uh, would be eligible for this kind of release. So you had a wide range of people who had done a lot of time. And then as sort of that pool uh, gets a little bit smaller, people who haven't done as much time, you see the grant rates go down. So I think if this, and the reason I included this was I think if, uh, the parole eligibility was expanded along the lines we're talking about, you'd see a similar dynamic. You'd see very high grant rates at first as sort of the pool of people who became suddenly eligible um, was much higher. And then as you sort of work through that backlog, the grant rate might go down. But I thought this data was also interesting on its own to take a look at how these things changed over time a little bit. So let's talk about the current pool of folks who are eligible for what is usually, you know, this uh, nonviolent parole eligibility process. The blue, this is the people serving determinant sentences in CDCR. The blue are the people who are currently eligible. The orange are the people who are not eligible and they would need some change in the law because they're convicted of not only nonviolent offenses. So it about it would about double the eligibility uh, pool of people. So that's the overview, and the um, and the idea is pretty simple. Is say instead of requiring a nonviolent conviction and only a nonviolent conviction, everyone who goes to prison uh, would be eligible for parole review after completing the term for their primary offense. An additional idea we may want to talk about here is exactly what is meant by full term. So right now, you don't get credit for good conduct or any programming you you've completed. Uh, your eligibility date is determined just purely on, you know, if you got sentenced to five years, you got to do that five years um, without enhancements and et cetera before you're eligible instead of getting time off for good uh, behavior or any of that programming. Mm -hmm. So I think it might be worth discussing giving people credit for the credit they've earned, which is what happens in the normal indeterminate lifer situation. So two ideas there. The first one more uh, um, important, I think. Uh before we kick off the conversation, I want to make one uh, clarification and one question. Um, first, a point of clarification is we're talking about eligibility for right. parole. We're not talking about the parole standard. That is a subsequent. We have a that is a subsequent recommendation. So we're just talking about eligibility. Who should be who should be even considered for parole? So I just want to emphasize that. Um, the second is this is a question. Um, I don't know if it's for Tom or whom, 
I'm not quite sure you you kicked this off saying that this would be, require a two thirds vote. Obviously, it require I understand it would require a two thirds vote to amend Proposition 57 and the Constitution. But why couldn't an ordinary statute just say that? Oh, I I take that back. It's because so, uh, never mind. Because so many of the people are um, second serving second strikers. So you're right. Uh, I take that. I I retract my uh, my my question. Um, and then uh, open it to the rest of the folks for um, uh, questions, suggestions, comments. Um, similar question. Uh, so this, so we need the two thirds not due to forty-seven or fifty-seven, but rather because of three strikes. Well, uh, and and Mike, I know you've you've thought about this a bit more than we have, but. I think to amend 57, that's a constitutional amendment. So it would, if you want to amend 57, that's one thing. But if you want to create sort of a parallel process that functions a lot like 57, but would technically be a different penal code section to apply to the, um, the rest of the folks who aren't covered by 57, that too would require a two thirds vote because you're, you're, you're covering strike offenses and nickel priors and things like that. So, but if we were to adopt the, or if we, we had a discussion about abolishing three strikes, for example, and if that were abolished, then this would, would this, that negate the need for this? <laughs> it, well, it would make, we would still have the nickel prior and some other sentencing enhancements, like some parts of the gang enhancement, for example, were done by voter initiative. So I think it would, um, it would remove a lot of the need for it, but not, all of it and you know the I think the nickel prior which adds five years to a sentence after strikes and I believe gun enhancements is the most common enhancement so it's a lot of people but yeah if, if three strikes was gone and there was retroactivity to remove it from people in prison which we didn't quite discuss um, this could probably be accomplished um, with a majority vote and you wouldn't leave as many people out so I'd want to sort of you know, dig into that a little bit more. It would be worth it to um, to understand that a little better. And then um, my other question is, um, there was, I don't want to call it a loophole, but Prop 57, my understanding is it didn't necessarily eliminate all violent offenses. I, I may be, um, my memory may be a little bit fuzzy on this, but the CDCR's own regulations, yes. they had more latitude for the regulations they could adopt as to who, um, would, who would be able to get um, type the credit that would bring them to early the ability to get uh, before the full board earlier. And the CDCR opted to, um, to narrow, narrow who they were gonna make eligible. Yes, I think that that's correct. So um, there's actually, a, it's not entirely settled about what nonviolent means in, in the text of the Constitution. There's actually a case scheduled for argument. On, I just saw it was scheduled for October 5th in the California Supreme Court. And the way it's come up there is what if you have, say, 10 convictions, one is for robbery, and then nine are for, you know, possession of stolen property or something nonviolent. Are you eligible for Prop 57 there? Under BPH's current rules, you're not because right. one of your convictions is violent. So it's this issue of sort of mixed convictions, even if the nonviolent ones um, sort of outnumber, um, for lack of a better word. Um, so that issue isn't entirely settled. The California Supreme Court is going to settle that, you know, soon. Um, but even with that, there's still, a, I think, around 20 thousand plus people who have purely violent convictions who wouldn't uh, benefit from that. And of course, and those are the people who are doing longer sentences that, uh, you know, our data shows us tend to be safer to release. So it's a little bit counterintuitive when we think about, you know, these eligibility things and doing it on the nature of the conviction sometimes. All right. Um, so we could, well, so there are ways to, um, to have uh, more latitude with Prop 57 than necessarily uh, either through the court ruling or through CDCR changing their regulations that are this recommendation, we could, even though 
we could look at as um, prim not primarily, but needed because of the three strikes. I think so. Okay. Okay. This is very reminiscent of the uh, the discussion of the gang enhancement last year, where you have part that was done by initiative, part that wasn't, and sort of threading that that needle um, can get very tricky while still doing something that's uh, meaningful. Yeah, and just, also, just go ahead, Justice Marino. Oh, just one one observation on on the additional proposal. You know, those convicted of uh, serious or violent felonies would only get like fifteen percent good time work time credits. And the yeah. others would get fifty percent, so they would, in a sense, be they'd be treated differently uh, in accordance with with the underlying offense. Right? That's right. I, I will say that the uh, that fifteen percent, I believe, doubled to around thirty three percent in, in May yeah. as part of the other power that CDCR has under Prop fifty seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, you're right. There are different uh, credit earning credits. rules based on the offense. Yeah. On the credit, speaking of the credit earning rules. Um, for the current Prop 57, the credit earning rules is a regulation that could be changed by statute. Um, I think that's a little bit unsettled. I think oh, CDCR would disagree with you. Okay. Right. <laughs> because the term of primary fence or whatever the, the way that the language is. Um, the other question, um, um, scrap that. I mean, if we're talking about sort of, you know, I see it as two issues. It's sort of, you know, what's the policy and then what's sort of the mechanism to enact it? And maybe if we separate, you know, if we if we want to decide today, yes, this makes sense as a policy or with some modifications, then staff can work on sort of, you know, here's the two or three vehicles that, that might be appropriate and the pros and cons of each. Because I think it, I wouldn't want to say anything without sort of researching a little more thoroughly because it, it gets very uh there's lots of peril <laughs> right and and the policy as opposed to the mechanism resonates with our conversation about indeterminacy and creating more indeterminacy and allowing more people an opportunity for earning earning uh release and this would cover uh, uh, would it mean that almost everybody would have at some point a chance to go before the parole board yeah, except, you know, for the that LWAP population that we started off talking about. Right. Uh, Senator Skinner, I think you had something to say. Um, no, I made my comments. So. All right. Does anybody else have uh, further thoughts on this one? Okay, Tom, All right. move on Great. to the floor. So now we're into the realm of uh, more of a majority vote or less. So hopefully um, that will Oh, free our minds. <laughs> uh, number four, creating a presumption for alternatives to incarceration. So, um, you know, I, I think of this idea as being just particularly apt for a body like the committee, which is sort of, a, you know, big picture. What's the purpose of the penal code? What, what are, why do we have the criminal law? <laughs> sort of, not that we're going to get that deep. Um, but, you know, right now, the, if you open up the penal code, there is no sort of, you know, section one isn't the penal code exists to do X, Y, Z. It just sort of says, you know, here's what, you know, uh, theft by force means. It just gets right into the weeds immediately. And the closest we come is in 1170, which was created by the determinant sentencing law in 1977, says the pur purpose of sentencing is public safety achieved through, um, you know, punishment, rehabilitation, and restorative justice. When that was first passed, it said the purpose of sentencing is punishment. So there was a clear statement back then, and now it's gotten a little wider. But there is no statement in the penal code right now that says, when should someone be imprisoned? Should other things be considered first? When does it make sense? Should punishment, what's the purpose of, a, of a, how long should a term of punishment um, be? You know, it's, it's usually left entirely to courts right now what, what direction they want to go. Um, I think that discretion makes sense, but it would also be appropriate to have some statements from the legislature saying, uh, you know, and we can talk about the sources of some of these, but the punishment should be no more severe than necessary, which I think is something that seems very commonsensical, and that incarceration should be the last point in the discussion, not the starting point, as I think it, it 
all too often is today. Um, and you, you know, it's nice to have a policy statement, but how do you put some teeth behind it? And I think the way we do that is to have a presumption that there should be an alternative to incarceration, in certain circumstances that we can look at in a minute. And um, the way we got into this was by looking um, at what happened in another big state in, in New York. So if you all remember in July, we, we heard about New York's experience with, you know, their incarceration numbers and their crime rates, to be honest. So uh, New York, I have the graph here sort of showing California in blue, New York in orange, our respective growth of our respective prison populations, and the red lines are when the respective peaks were. So we can see that New York and California sort of started off at the same in the late 70s, actually. And even though California's population is we were about 5 million more people here, you know, our both of our prison populations went up. New York's peaked in 1999, and it's started to go down and it's kept going down. And since that peak, they've reduced their prison population by 50%. Uh, and, you know, and our peak was in uh, 2006 when we had about 175,000 people in our prisons. And ours has gone down significantly, but um, we haven't quite um, hit that 50% reduction yet. So as you all might remember from the July uh, discussion, why did this happen? Why was New York able to do this? And the answer was, well, New York City did it. It wasn't really a New York State phenomenon. It was something mm -hmm. that New York City did. And there wasn't a particular law or legislative solution that did it. In fact, in the late 90s, sentence lengths increased. So this peak may have been, uh, they may have been able to do this even faster without the without those legislative changes. And what we found after talking to a lot of people um, was that this was really, they just put less people into prison. It kind of, kind of sounds kind of simple when you say it that way, but it's really that profound. We often talk about shortening sentences, but the other flip side of that is, if you just put less people in, you're going to have less people in. I mean, it's it's a little tautological, but there we are. And it was really a, uh, one of the big drivers of that was a cultural thing where there were more alternatives to incarceration available. You know, New York City has a lot of nonprofit alternatives compared to, I think, um, a lot of our state, unfortunately. And there was just growing acceptance by prosecutors, judges that this made sense even for more serious cases. And that in combination with a few other things, uh, I think helped lead to these results based on what we found. So our thought was that, you know, we can't legislate culture, culture beats, beats policy, whatever the cliche is for breakfast. Um, but maybe there's a start we can do by having a clear statement in the penal code saying, you know, when uh, sentence, just those things I said before, punishment shouldn't be any more severe than necessary, and incarceration should be avoided when possible. Our models for this were uh, in the federal uh, court, and I'm sure Justice Mourinho can can tell us that there's a statement about, you know, sim along similar lines to some of this, and the model penal code has similar things too. So we'd sort of have this uh, statement about what punishment is for, broad statement about when incarceration would be necessary. And we put some teeth behind it with these presumptions that we're going to presume you're going to get an alternative to incarceration if first felony, nonviolent offense, and any misdemeanor. And of course, we'd want to be clear that this isn't the only scenario where you should get an alternative of some kind, but there will be a presumption for these. And we have some thoughts about when the presumption could be overcome, you know, clear and convincing evidence that there's either a substantial likelihood that re release would result in great bodily harm to another person or failing to impose incarceration would depreciate the seriousness of the offense. So it would still preserve a substantial amount of judicial discretion, but would give some sense of uh, what the point of the penal code is in the 21st century in California. Um, the last thing I'll add here is, you know, we do have a lot of existing diversion laws as the committee looked at last April, uh, sort of hard to believe we we're still having meetings <laughs> back then if you think about it, but we, we had a, a lot of discussion about diversion. We heard a little bit about the current mental health diversion law, which is penal code 1001.36. And there are some things I think we could also recommend that would strengthen that particular alternative to incarceration, which, um, you know, covers uh, a lot of people as is, but there are, are things that could be done. And those two things there are, if the prosecutor and defendant agree that mental health diversion is appropriate, it should be granted. Right now, um, that isn't the case, that even if the two antagonistic parties agree, a judge does not necessarily have to grant it. And the second thing would be creating our favorite option, which is another presumption, uh, which would say if someone has a di uh, one of the mental disorders that's specified in the statute, we're going to presume there's a connection to their offense. Right now, the burden is always on the defendant to make out that the mental disorder was a significant factor in the commission of the offense. 
And um, I think it makes it more difficult than it perhaps it should be in every case that that has to be sort of uh, proven in court. So we just create a presumption that if you have a mental disorder and you have a charge defense, there's probably a connection that can be, you know, disproved, disputed by the judge, the prosecutor, whatever the case may be. But uh, it would sort of strengthen that existing diversion law. So that's the, uh, the idea for this one. There's a lot there. I have to say that I'm very um, impressed by this idea. I think it's hard to go from sort of an abstract idea of um, encouraging alternatives to incarceration. And I think that this is a really smart way of, of doing that and putting the teeth into it. I don't know the best way to, to package it or not, but I, but I think that this is um, really well um, thought through and resonates with a lot of the testimony that we've heard over time, but also some of the best studies that we've seen that um, really do show, especially for, um, for the most part, we're talking about lower level or first time offenses, mm -hmm. um, that public safety is better served um, with local alternatives um, than by incarceration. So just from a pure public safety perspective, I think that what data we have so far supports these ideas, not to mention the justice aspects of it. So I, think I, I'm, I have to say, I started off thinking that it was very abstract and uh, pie in the sky, um, but, um, but the, the, the details are really fleshed out for me. So thank you. I just jump in um, with regard to the first uh, recommendation. Uh, the punishment should be no more severe than necessary. There's a similar statement like that in federal law. And um, as a practitioner in the federal court system for many years, uh, we use that in our sentencing papers and in, you know, before the courts in every single sentencing. And I do think that, you know, some judges might have ignored it, but I do think it, it resonated with, um, with other judges. And I think just hearing those words uh, makes makes judges think, you know, they do really want to follow the law. And if that is what the law says, you know, they might be more careful about what they're um, sentencing people to. And hopefully that would reduce sentences in appropriate cases. Right. People have thoughts on this? I, I'm fine with them. I'm surprised it's not a consideration uh, anyway. You know, because we've had some surprising sentences for voluntary manslaughter and even murder, I think, where probation has been imposed. <laughs> uh, just think Latasha Harlan seemed down in Compton. That sentence that, you know, had a huge, huge uh, impact on what we think about the fairness of our criminal justice system. So uh, I think some balance here is, is good. And like I said, I'm surprised that it isn't kind of a theme in our penal code. So pretty non-controversial. Yes, Senator Skinner. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Not easy being in this kind of role, but presumption, when it comes to legislature, uh, <clears throat> presumption is um, not all that welcomed. There's uh, the argument for judicial discretion is an easier argument to make. The presumption is viewed as tying the judge's hands. Mm -hmm. um, but just FYI, uh, the, the statement that punishment should be no more severe than necessary, I think that has a lot of resonance I can't speak to, you know, easy or not easy for in terms of legislature, but it has a lot of resonance. The adding to it an additional explicit statement of incarceration should be avoided when possible would, would encounter a lot more opposition. Um, and so is there a way to thread the needle where the, the first statement is strong enough that the second is implied without having to be explicit. Um, the, uh, um, uh, 
anyway, those are just just some thoughts. So my reaction to that is, um, first of all, I think we, I was certainly very impressed by the New York story. Yes. And that this was a cultural shift, not a legislative shift. And how do you do that? And can even a legislator do? And I think there is interaction between both. Currently, and, and I also appreciate that, it's, you know, judicial discretion. Oh, sorry, Professor, I didn't see your hand, but I'll get to you in a sec. Um, judges have an incredible amount of discretion right now. As we've seen, they can order probation in murder cases. And under 1385, they've had this wide open, what was the word that you used earlier, Just, Justice Moreno? Enigma. Enigma, <laughs> en enigmatic power <laughs> to- uh, Amorphous, yeah. Uh, yes, well, no, that's, that's, that's the- I know, I know. Yeah. Right, so they have this discretion right now. The, 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 the issue is that they don't, that judges typically don't use it because the culture is not to use it or not to use it as at least as, as sufficiently as we want. Um, I totally appreciate that judges don't, or that presumptions are seen as, as, as kind of heavy handed. They're, ob they're obviously less heavy handed than a true mandate, like you have to do this, right? Mm -hmm. The legislature could do that. And it's, and it's an attempt to, to uh, make a compromise. And I know that this is part of the conversation that we had in SB 81, obviously. Um, but I will also just say, and I don't know if this really matters, I think as just, Justice Moreno and uh, Justice Espinoza will attest to, is that a presumption, any judge who wants to overcome a presumption exactly. yeah. can yeah. overcome that presumption. This, this, right, this, yes. I, I think in, in reality, a judge is never going to sit there and be like, oh I don't God. wanna do this, but, yeah. I have, but my hands are tied by a presumption. Um, so, now I know that that's you know what happens in the real world, and the legislatures maybe is the, is the sausage factory as we've discussed. Um, so that's why, I, as Tom said, we've you know maybe it's a crutch or maybe it's our favorite tool. Is this we've you know come back to this idea of a presumption? But those those are some of my uh, thoughts and reactions. Uh, now, Professor Ochin. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, so I'm in favor of all of the recommendations, let me just say that. Um, uh, but I, on this one, I wanted to ask uh, Senator Skinner, Skinner about the um, perceived uh, resistance to the second point around uh, incarceration should be avoided if at all possible. Um, I, I'm interested in more in, in hearing about that, but I, I, my question is about uh, substitution of language. Would something like the least restrictive means um, encounter the same kind of resistance, right? It would virtually, it would ba basically say the same thing, right? If you can accomplish the goals of sentencing uh, with something least less restrictive than incarceration, you should do so, but without saying incarcerate, you know, we should avoid incarceration. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about uh, the, temperature of the legislature with regard to language uh, of that sort. Um, and then I have some thoughts about the presumptions and then our, our general, our overall role. Um, uh, so with regard to the presumption, my concern was not about uh, discretion. Uh, it was about whether this would be useful at all, given how easy it is to overcome presumptions as uh, Chair Romano said that in fact, this would not uh, in any way limit uh, judicial discretion because it is a permissive, uh, presumption. It is not mandatory. Um, and uh, it can be easily overcome. Uh, so my question was about additional guidance. Should we give additional factors to be weighed in order to overcome the presumption around um, incarceration for folks who fall into these categories that judges would need to uh, describe on the record um, orally uh, and so forth when they are setting aside this presumption for whatever reasons. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that we should advise the legislature to codify, uh, codify as well. Um, and then my last point is about our role. Uh, obviously our primary role is to uh, advise the public 
And our primary audience is the legislature around revisions to the penal code. Mm -hmm. But I think that isn't just about uh, legislative revisions in the next term or the term thereafter. It's also about consciousness raising and shifting the culture around incarceration and punishment. So that informs my general um, posture with regard to some of the larger, more complicated, challenging recommendations that we're making around life without parole, three strikes, these sort of presumptions, language shifting in culture around presumptions regarding incarceration. I view these uh, recommendations uh, as practical in some instances, but also aspirational. So I don't think we should step back from making the kind of bold, broad recommendations that um, are called for in this moment uh, as we're facing in some ways a crisis and other ways an opportunity around our prison population, our jails, our jail population and spending on law enforcement and policing. So um, I hope that, you know, that's just sort of a general statement about um, the role of our report, right? The report can inform le uh, legislation, but it can also inform the thinking of legislators um, around things like resistance uh, to statements like incarceration should be avoided. If we can give them the data, uh, the research uh, that supports these conclusions, maybe they won't uh, um, adopt this kind of language in the near term, but in the long term, perhaps it will produce a, a cultural shift. And I think we shouldn't um, shy away from making these kinds of statements. So Mike, I, I will address some of those aspects, but I really appreciate Professor Ocean's comments. So I, as I indicated before, I will express these things from, the, from my perspective on what I think the legislature uh, reaction to, but I do not think that those should be a major or primary factor in our adoption. Our adoption needs to be what we think is the appropriate ways to recommend revision to the penal code. So um, I, I want to be very clear about that. Now, um, on, on uh, and Professor Ocean um, intervene if I don't uh, exactly answer the main question you wanted, but uh, so just on presumption, for example, um, we may understand that just judges have the ability to override it. However, in the in the parlance of the discussion, say in a legislative context, that isn't even factored. Which is why, for example, in eighty one SB eighty one, we recommended presumption the bill does no longer include presumption. So it, uh, so the action that is on the governor's desk, the statute that's on the governor's desk does not include presumption. Now on the issues of whether, how we would word um, say punishment should be no more severe than necessary. And then what, what, what additional qualifier, whatever do we write if we don't adopt incarceration should be avoided when possible. My, the, the reason I raise the incarceration should be avoided when possible is that um, there, there is a lot of conversation now around whether prison is ever appropriate and the whole abolitionist movement, for example. And, uh, and that is something that I think within within popular culture, academic circles, the public at large, legislature, you name it, is, needs a lot more percolation and is not at the point yet of, of wide acceptance or adoption. And that language explicitly like that might be perceived to be a endorsement of that as a, uh, as a, principle. And so language that is more around if there are, um, when there are, and maybe Professor Ocean, you were getting at this, but when there are suitable alternatives, whether it be probation, alternative types of custody, <clears throat> programs, community-based programs, <clears throat> that those should be pursued. When, when the court feels they are appropriate, that that may be somewhat comparable to 
the explicit language of incarceration should be avoided when possible, but more um, acceptable or palatable. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is that, and this is not in addressing your question, but it occurred to me as we discussed this, that if we, um, if we are, uh, say, if our recommendation is emphasize, emphasizes, say, probation or parole instead of incarceration, there's a lot of feeling amongst the, um, those who have been incarcerated or those who have been on long probation or parole. There's a lot of feeling about that. And I would like to hear from, from those stakeholders more so that we could understand those nuances and how they affect the, the, the population before we, we adopt it. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I've done some research on probation, particularly on its effects on women. And many of the, the folks who were directly impacted that I interviewed uh, said they would prefer to be incarcerated than to be on probation because of the way in which pro probation extended uh, state control over their lives. And in fact, if, you, if they added up all of the times that they were incarcerated, you know, this is before many of the reforms, mm -hmm. but uh, the perception was that, you know, uh, long-term probation was not desirable uh, in, in contrast to say a 30 day jail sentence. Yeah, I, I wanted to weigh in on that too. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing and all these alternatives, especially for folks that we've seen this in many instances in the mentally ill context, you can do a, a year long mental health treatment program or do 30 days in jail. And people will say, I'll just take the 30 days in jail rather right. than a year long mental. Um, whether or not that's in their best interest or not, but it's a tricky, problem in these alternatives. Uh, Judge Espinoza. I just had a question about this language and then I have some observations about the second slide in mental health diversion, but um, this statement punishment should be no more severe than necessary seems incomplete to me. It seems like a judge who sees that is gonna say necessary to, to do what, to, to achieve what, to promote what. Um, maybe it's intentional intentionally, um, I don't want to say vague, but intentionally broad. But I don't know whether we want to include, um, as we have in other spaces, just a sentence that says necessary to ensure or promote public safety. I don't know. It just seems incomplete to me, but there may be a very good reason why it just says when necessary, then necessary. I, I think we borrowed that almost verbatim from the model penal code or the federal statement. Rick, Rick or Laura can let me know <laughs> which of those it was or both. <laughs> yeah, I think it was borrowed very closely from one or both of those. I, I, I don't think it would hurt to add an additional piece to that to say no more than severe than necessary to achieve the purposes of punishment or to achieve public safety, if, if we listed it as the purposes of punishment, it would be as defined in the penal code, which the previous slide. Uh, that, that just seems circular. Listed the mass. I agree with Judge Espinosa that no longer the necessary can be very widely interpreted to be like, oh, well, I think it's you know necessary, but necessary yeah. to achieve the purpose of the penal code to me, it seems a little yeah. circular. I would just say the purpose of public safety. You might just say to serve the ends of justice. I also think that that's, I would, the, I, why should anybody serve more time than necessary to, yeah. than for to public safety? I mean, really, 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 that's, you know, I think the bottom line from my perspective. Now, how do we judge what that number is? That's a whole very complicated question, but um, that's my feeling on that. Professor Ochin. I, well, I, I guess I, I wonder about whether public safety should be, whether we should modify right. necessary with public safety, because that obviously is not the only consideration, right, when it comes to, to punishment. Um, there may be questions about rehabilitation, which, you know, you may say, well, that's attached to public safety as well. But, and I also don't want to concede that, that um, you know, public safety should be the primary uh, consideration when it comes to our penal code. So uh, I, I don't know if we should leave it uh, 
uh, broad and, and, and open and subject to interpretation, or I think maybe I, I would, I guess I would concur with Rick's suggestion that it should be to, to achieve the purposes of punishment, which are myriad, um, but I don't think we should concede that public safety is the only consideration uh, with regard yeah. to the sentence. That, that's why I couch my comments in terms of, you know, I just don't know, but that sentence seems incomplete to me. Yeah. Well, did, did you hear my my comment necessary to serve the ends of justice that yeah. goes both ways mm -hmm. punishment public safety what's right it is vague but it's it adds to necessary in the in the federal uh federal statute i like the ends of justice by the way um but in the federal statute it does have several purposes that it sort of lists out so it's you comply yeah. with the purposes set forth in paragraph two, and then paragraph two lists out um, reflect the seriousness of the offense, promote respect for the law, promote yeah. just punishment, afford adequate deterrence, protect the public, and right. provide the defendant with needed educational and vocational training, medical care, or other yeah. correctional treatment in the most effective manner. So, yeah, that's that's too that's much. Big, <laughs> a lot longer than maybe we were thinking. Yeah, ends of justice. <laughs> Professor Ochin? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I think uh, Justice Marino's suggestion is probably the best compromise of the various options that we've discussed today. I actually, uh, we should, I, I want to continue the thoughts on it. I actually don't. I, I, I think that, you know, to, to Laura's point, your attorney going into courts, you know, the, the defense will go in and say the sentence should be re reduced because uh, it's no longer necessary ends of, ends of justice. And the prosecution will use the exact same words. The ends of justice require a longer sentence. Yeah. I just don't. I don't think you end up with very much. If the, if the point is to encourage alternatives to incarceration, right? Which is this is this is the bucket. Um, I don't think. I think the end, ends of justice is does not do it. To, to, yeah. In my in my in my mind. Yeah. I mean, this is just kind of a statement say in the penal code. I, I just don't think you need all the cataloging of, of factors uh, that can be developed in an argument as you just suggested. Anyway. I don't know. I think I think that's a, this is a larger conversation that um, <laughs> it's not we're not gonna resolve today because I, I don't know that there is that we have um, consensus on what the driving factor should be in sentencing. I think we are coming to consensus around, you know, we should first consider alternatives to incarceration, um, but be beyond, you know, and I, and I think that that seems to be the consensus of the committee, but I don't know that we agree on uh, what the primary purposes of punishment should be. Um, and so I think it's difficult to come up with the kind of list that uh, that Laura uh, just um, or Laura just uh, just uh, listed off to us. Um, justice is vague; it's broad. Um, it does give some room for argumentation. Um, and then the suggestion around the purposes of punishment, as defined in the Penal Code, again is the very thing that we're trying to uh, revise, right? So. Um, that, which is why I uh, suggested that I, I supported Justice Moreno's um, uh, uh, a modifier. But, you know, I'm, perhaps the, the solution is to leave it open as we have it now. Yeah, I, I think that I, I hear what you're saying. I think that that's, that's wise. I mean, right now, 1385, you know, has this interest of justice language built mm -hmm. right into it, right? I mean, that's already statute. Um, and so, we can leave that. Um, and, and I think that you're right, Professor Ochin, that we don't need to jump into the deep end, the very heavy question about what is the purpose of punishment in order to achieve the goal here, which is to encourage alternatives to incarceration. Those can be separated from, from one another. So um, other thoughts before we move on? I wanted to quickly give the committee after what Skinner, Senator Skinner said um, about SB 81 and how the language changed from presumption to something else. The, the something else was just um, a requirement that the court should afford great weight to certain factors. So if people are uncomfortable with presumption, we could always 
convert over to something like affording great weight to these these three uh, factors. Just just on that point, I, I want to fall back on something that uh, Assemblymember Lee and Senator Skinner said, which was perhaps this: we don't need to worry about the sausage making, right? This may be these may be our general principles. And this will be resolved through the committee process and, and through negotiations. But I think what we should be clear about are our general principles and our suggestions for how uh, the penal code should be interpreted and administered. Um, and uh, you know, uh, very clear articulations of the research and data that supports our conclusions. And then let the folks that are professionals uh, and our elected representatives uh, work through the legislative process to effectuate our recommendations. Judge Edson, I think you were going to um, talk about the uh, mental health diversion part of it. I don't know if, if it still makes sense to do that, but I'd, I'd be interested. Just have a couple quick observations. One is that um, this requirement that judges grant mental health diversion if both sides of a case agree in the adversarial process. I will tell you in, in practice, that's exactly what happens in our mental health diversion programs in Los Angeles County. It's a very rare, very rare for lawyers to bring a case before the court settled um, and have a judge reject that. Um, judges are usually very thankful when the lawyers are able to resolve cases without engaging fully in the adversarial process. I will tell you that um, there will be a great deal of pushback from the bench on handing over the decision-making process to the lawyers in the courtroom. Um, I'm not saying I'm opposed to this. I'm just pointing out a, a, a minefield that we're about to enter. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I have a comment really for Senator Skinner and Assemblyman Lee regarding um, mental health diversion. We do mental health diversion in my department in Los Angeles County through a grant we received from the Department of State Hospitals that funds 200 beds. Um, and we have, they're full, they're always full. Um, and we are, we are diverting people who are, who have a long history of serious mental illness and are charged with serious felonies. We, we don't, we don't pick the low hanging fruit in Los Angeles County in our program. And I just want to say that, um, one of the biggest obstacles to the implementation of Penal Code Section 1000.136 is the lack of resources um, to create community-based programs to care for people um, who are gonna be diverted. And I would encourage the, the legislators on the committee as you go about the business of implementing this recommendation to consider ways to incentivize counties by providing resources to um, stand up the programs that are necessary to care for people in the community and allow them to be diverted and have their charges dismissed at the end of the diversionary period because it's 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 hard it's hard to do this work um, unless it's properly resourced let me second third fourth fifth double down triple down on what a judge espino every single person who is involved in all the programs that we've spoken to said the number one problem isn't the statute Number one problems isn't the length of punishment. There's many, many times when everybody says this person should go to an alternative program, whether it's mental health or drug treatment or some other program, but there just aren't programs available. That's the number one problem. So maybe if we build more laws like this, we'll build it and they will come. But uh, I just want to second, I, I can't emphasize that point enough. Yes, Senator Skinner. Well, I think in our report that um, however we adopt this particular one, I think we need to add some detail in our report. You know, we, we're reviewing the penal code and we're, if we, assuming we adopt this, we are adopting this because we know that um, people who, the, if the primary reason they've come before the court is due to a mental health disorder that are incarceration system in our jails are not the place that have the capability of treating them. And that it is worth it, that is known. However, I think that we, the more detail that we can provide and data to back it up, then it, 
it, again, it's not that this is not known, it is known. And the fact that our jails and our prisons are now California's mental health facilities, very inadequate, but they are, is also known. Um, but it's this conundrum we're in. And, you know, why, again, just why counties haven't done more? I mean, counties, it is cheaper for them to, uh, to in most places, not all, to put the person in a mental health bed versus in jail. Jail is still very expensive. Um, and so it's not just a matter of the state funding the counties, but it is still not utilized that much by counties. And, and when it comes to the state itself, we, even though we have dropped the population in our state facilities, we've not really reduced the total CDCR budget by much. So it's not like we've had a situation where our reduction in population has achieved some savings that we could then direct towards mental health beds. So the, re the reason I think it's so important for us to really stress it and give the data in our report and that, our, that the, in the committee in confronting this realize that regardless of revisions to the penal code, that this outstanding fact remains and is uh, that the, the jail and um, prison system are not the place to deal with people who are in, in our court system due to mental health problems. Um, and then of course the legislature and the administration just has to figure out ways to, to either provide the funding or, or the alternatives um, so we can achieve it. But I think the more our, our report can make, state the obvious and give data that supports the obvious, the better. I, I, can, I couldn't agree more on that. We've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how many mental health beds there are in, in California, how many substance abuse treat, licenses, substance abuse treatment programs beds. I think that'd be a tremendous resource if we could put that. I know that that's a big burden on the committee, but on the staff, but I think that that'd be a great resource um, and service. Uh, Judge Espinoza. Yeah, I just want to agree with Senator Skinner and I don't want to leave um, the committee and folks on this in this meeting that Los Angeles County isn't stepping up um, and trying to reduce the mental health population. We currently have in our program 3,000, I like to refer to them, 3,000 souls who are currently in our care and community beds. Um, some of that money has come from the state through the Department of State Hospitals in reducing the FIS population. Um, and, and as I've indicated, we have a, a, a robust diversion program, but the county has provided significant resources in Los Angeles to, to get us to the, to the moment where we're at. That having been said, um, we're, we're tapped out. We're, we have, all of our beds are full and the mental health population in the jail continues to grow. Prior to COVID, it was 30% of the population. It's now 40%. And there are 6,000 people in mental health housing in the jail the Rand Corporation did a study of that population two years ago and made it quite clear that 60% of those folks could come out safely under existing um, diversion strategies in effect in Los Angeles County, but we're, we're struggling to find the resources to accomplish that. So I don't wanna give the impression that Los Angeles County hasn't stepped up. I know it's a, there are regional differences, but the fact of the matter is, is this care, while it can be expensive, is so much um, more fiscally sound than the jail. We, we, we care for people at a rate that's just so much um, more financially beneficial to the county than, than keeping them in the jail. Thank you, Senator Skinner. Uh, I, I want to um, close up the session and then take a quick break for um, lunch or an hour. Let's take a lunch hour. But lastly, um, I don't know if anybody else have any questions about alternatives to incarceration, but Judge Espinosa, can you briefly, if possible, I know that LA has a new alternatives to incarceration like division within the CEO's yes. office or and Judge Armstead's program. Can you explain what that is? And what, is that is any helpful guide to us? I think it's a very helpful guide. I will tell you that my department, well, it was the CEO and, and other county departments put together the alternatives to incarceration work group, which is a 
over a year stakeholder engagement process that involved law enforcement, county departments engaging with community activists. And um, that report resulted in the creation of Judge Armstead's department. It might be helpful to have her come and talk to us. She's been on the job for almost a year. She has been, as is the case when you become a county employee, I've learned if you do something well, you're rewarded by giving lots of other things to do. And so her, her plate continues to grow, but her role is largely to resource um, programs that have demonstrated success and roll out it and expand those programs and roll out additional programs that aren't currently in existence. The Office of Diversion and Reentry, my department, is currently, prior to the creation of the ATI initiative, um, was sort of the face of alternatives to incarceration. We've been focused exclusively on, not exclusively, but primarily on um, people who are in the jail um, and getting them out. We do have three other divisions. We have a reentry division, a community-based diversion, and harm reduction division that's doing a lot around um, overdose prevention. And then we have a youth diversion division. But um, I think it would be helpful to hear from Judge Armstead on this subject. Um, because she is currently in charge um, of, of developing strategies for alternatives to incarceration. We, we are collaborative partners, by the way. She and I speak frequently. We, we are in most of the same meetings. Um, so if that's helpful. I concur. I've spoken to her a couple of times. She's very impressive and on it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I do wanna, we've been meeting and talking for a while. I think we've been making good progress. I do wanna take a lunch break. Um, does anybody have any final comments on this proposal before we, and when we come back from lunch, we'll do the last. I think we have three more to go through. Is that right, Tom? Uh, four more. Four. So we're halfway done. So we're halfway or done. We're picking up speed. <laughs> um, anybody have any last on the alternatives to incarceration recommend, recommendation issue? Okay, let's take an hour lunch break. Um, I'll see you everybody back at uh, one o'clock and uh, we'll continue with our agenda. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, and have a good lunch. So, uh, so the proposal would be to um, reduce these sentences to, to allow appellate courts to reduce these sentences in the interest of justice. And it would, and I think this is envisioned as sort of being a safety valve that in some, you know, discrete number of cases every year, there'd be an opportunity for um, sentences that are just too harsh or too excessive to be corrected in the appellate process. So as I mentioned, this is something um, that is currently allowed in New York State on appeal there. And the statute there is extremely broad. It explicitly says there has, doesn't have to be to the trial court's uh, thing, uh, decision. Uh, and it can even be done in guilty plea cases. And it's not something that needs to be preserved below. So the appellate court has sort of an independent power in the interest of justice uh, to uh, reduce sentences that are harsh or excessive. So this chart here uh, are the um, criminal appellate statistics in the last few years from 2015 to 2020. The gray are cases that were essentially affirmed. The blue are cases that were modified, which would include sentence modifications along the lines that we're speaking about and would, in my experience, mostly be sentence modifications. And the orange are traditional reversals where conviction is reversed and either dismissed or sent back down for further proceedings. So you can see that um, these sort of sentence uh, reviews don't overwhelm the system. They're a little bit more than there are standard reversals every year. And overall, it's about 7% of cases a year will get some kind of modification, which is about equal to what their reversal rate is. So if you add up reversals and modifications, you're around 15% of uh, cases that get appealed um, have some kind of change made to them along those lines. So, um, how would this work in California? Well, I think it would be a very similar structure that that could possibly work. You know, you allow an appellate court to review a sentence for excessiveness, which means they could change sort of what the base sentence was, meaning what the triad was, if it's a determinate sentence. 
uh, whether sentences should be consecutive or concurrent, and then uh, whether sentencing enhancements uh, should apply. And again, this would be sort of essentially de novo review to use the legal term of what the sentence is without necessarily there needing to be deference to what the sentencing court did below. Um, and number two here is to allow this to happen even in cases where there was a guilty plea. So that sort of goes along with the uh, safety valve nature of this. It's not something that would be done in every case, but would uh, be available for appropriate cases. So that's the uh, overview there. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, Justice Moreno. Uh, Tom, 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 yeah. Oh, let me. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah. Tom, where where does the impetus for this uh, suggestion come from? I mean, is this something I may have missed that we discussed? <laughs> It was, it was, yes, it was um, discussed. Uh, Professor Tonery at the last meeting in July mentioned this, and there was a little back and forth about it. Uh, yeah. What he told the committee was that this is, he called it second guessing. The second guessing of sentences yeah. by an appellate court is very common in Europe. Um, and I, I think there are some other states that do it aside from New York. New York is, I think, the one that's most analogous to, you know, California for the, you know, environment and the, and the size. And to me, you know, this sort of presents an interesting uh paradox or something like that you know we talked earlier about how the judicial council in particular is very sensitive to guarding judges discretion so this right. idea sort of does both it gives some judges more discretion while uh you know acting as sort of a review that didn't exist previously so maybe the trial judges win just because there's more of them but uh it certainly sort of is an interesting um uh take on that on that dynamic um and i do know that this i think to uh, a, a legal culture and landscape where this doesn't happen, it seems it can seem quite radical because there's an idea that, you know, only yeah. trial courts have this ability right. to, to do it. Yeah. But, and, and I sort of certainly understand that tradition, but, you know, this also seems like it address, it has the potential to address some of these discussions the committee has had around implicit bias, where, you know, if an appellate court is looking only at sort of what is often called the cold record in a case, whether that makes sense as a name for it or not. Mm -hmm. But um, it sort of removes some of those, um, I think, opportunities for there to be implicit bias. And sometimes you look at a sentence on paper, and uh, I think most people would agree just something went wrong <laughs> in, in this case. So there was maybe some kind of personality disagreement. I think that happens more than we might be comfortable with. But I think there actually is a lot of value to removing it from sort of uh, you know, having, and this comes up when we're talking about parole suitability hearings too, about, you know, looking in someone's eye and thinking that, you know, human beings can make some kind of, you know, value judgment um, like that. Right. There's no reason to ever disturb that, that process. So I think it also has that advantage as well to it. So you're saying that even in a case where there's no legal error, uh, technically, that someone could just argue that this sentence is excessive without I mean, it has to be pointing to something like in the determinate sentence, you know, the person didn't deserve a high term, the court was wrong and should have imposed the midterm. But that's based on something tangible. Uh, and the court will reverse and say, you know, based on the factors considered, it's, it should have been a midterm and not a high term. Yes, absolutely, Justice Mourinho. I mean, I think a typical argument you see is, um, well, the co-defendant who was more culpable got yeah. a lower sentence. And and what the exact path to reducing the sentences would be a little different in California because we have this triad structure, but it's it's traditional sentencing arguments. You say it's disproportionate just to the offense. It's a first offense. I was very young. Co-defendant uh, didn't get as harsh, or you can even compare to um, other cases in the, in the jurisdiction. So, you know, if you go across the hallway, this $20 drug sale, you know, yeah. got probation and across the street, you know, he got five years in prison or whatever the case may be. It's it's sort of the traditional sentencing arguments that that you'd see. Of course, there has to be material in the record uh, to make those yeah. arguments. Um, so, so why do we need this if the appellate courts are already engaging in that kind of, uh, you well, know, an analysis? I, you know. I can answer that. I, I, yeah. The answer to that is that it's reviewed for abuse of discretion, and you see that all right. the time. Exactly. Yeah. Decisions where judges say, um, "Well, I may not." Appellate courts say, "I might not have uh, issued this sentence, but it's not an abuse of discretion." So, in some ways, where this is a proposal to limit to say it's a de novo review on the sentence. Tom, I just wanted to clarify something. 
Mm-hmm. Um, no new evidence can be presented, right? So you can't bring in new mitigating evidence. It has to be whatever's on the record. Whatever's on the record, yeah. Right. Not in the ordinary right. course. Sometimes you see people try to do a motion to supplement the record, but that is unusual. It's pretty know? rare. Pretty yeah. rare. Uh, the second thing is, I mean, is this a big issue? I mean, what are we talking about? How many numbers and impact that, how significant is it uh, where the courts are going to you know, really intercede and say, hey, well, I think this is an excessive sentence without some kind of legal basis or misapplication of, of, of the law by the trial court. I don't, see it, I don't see it as a big issue. Well, in, in New York, what is it, Tom? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go back to that. So the, um, if we look at the blue, this is, you know, it's about 190-ish cases a year out of roughly, I don't know, 2,300. It's different each year. So it's not, you know, as I said, it doesn't, my impression is it doesn't overwhelm the system, but it is used, you know, it's not, um, it's not sort of like a writ of quorum nobis or something truly exotic like that. It's an ordinary thing that, um, uh, you know, is appropriate to, to, to bring in many cases. Yeah. Well, my, my initial thinking is we have bigger fish to fry. (laughs) <laughs> but if, what is, if, not, is not worth uh, a kettle of fish, so to speak. What if you made it retroactive, though? I don't know. I mean, the whole idea of appellate uh, courts kind of second guessing, as you put it, which is a good term, is uh, and you know, deference to the trial judge who's there. I, you know, unless there's some kind of abuse, you know, by the trial judge, say Manny Real here and used to be in L.A. or some, you know, some something other than hey i would have sentenced this guy differently and then you need three judges to well two judges at the intermediate level to to agree so in the long run i I don't see this really being a significant problem professor ochin uh so i just have a question about um appellate courts in california when it comes to reviewing uh, criminal sentences. Uh, don't appellate courts have the obligation to ensure some degree of, um, not necessarily uniformity, but that there aren't sort of wildly excessive sentences? Is that not the case in California or, because uh, it is the case in other states, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and at the federal system. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just wondering is, is, should we articulate this as less a radical change and more along the lines of uh, coming into alignment with what other states are doing in terms of the role of appellate courts with respect to criminal sentences. So that, that's my first question. Um, the second question is, even if we made the recommendation, would it have any practical effect? Exactly. Are, are, are judges going to disturb uh, the sentencing determinations of their colleagues who are closer to the defendants, the case, and so forth? So even if they had the discretion, would they use it? Uh, right. is, is really my question. It's going to foment a lot of resentment uh, between the trial court judges. I never sat on the appellate, intermediate appellate court, which would resolve 100% of these issues. It'd be good to get the perspective of a court of appeal justice, because uh, they do deal with these sentencing issues much more than the California Supreme Court. So I, I would like to get their, their input. I just don't see it as a big issue that would merit being included in a sentencing, I mean, the penal code revision. I I really think the more important, I mean, I I don't disagree with this recommendation, but I think if we want to have a real practical effect, the most important thing that we can do is define what the, you know, outer bounds of sentencing should be. Um, And if we think that there's too much uh, variation uh, in terms of what uh, judges are doing, uh, then we should tighten up those ranges, uh, or uh, you know, lower lower the the maximum sentence, or, or you know, uh, and so I think that's really uh, where. In other words, I think we should be thinking about where judges use their discretion at the tri- at the trial level, um, or at the sentencing at the point of sentencing. Uh, that seems to me to would better get at what we're concerned about, which is excessive sentencing. Yeah. Senator Skinner. Um, Is this, on the same kind of line of questioning, is this, would it have the ability to have an impact on 
for example, if we see in the data, which I suspect we will, that um, certain regions of California have disproportionately uh, longer senses or extreme senses, one might say, for the same crime. And might this have a way to um, even that out or not? The regional differences. No. So, uh, per uh, Professor Ochen, did you have a response to that? No, I, think I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that we, we, we I, mean, certainly... it, I don't know. It just seems to me pr like practically judges would not take the invitation, even if we gave them the power to adjust uh, sentences um, for excessiveness. But I do think that I think that it is surprising to me that appellate judges uh, or appellate courts aren't tasked with looking at sort of trends in sentencing in their jurisdiction to ensure there aren't extreme outliers. That to me seems maybe like the same uh, as this recommendation, but it seems to me that that should be a charge that appellate courts should have in the state of California if they don't currently. They do not currently. Certainly that's true. Judge Espinoza? I was just going to respond to Senator Skinner's regional disparity observation. Most of the justices in the Court of Appeals come out of the local trial courts. And to the extent that there are local cultures, they translate right up into the, the Court of Appeals in my experience. I'm not sure, I'm not sure it would address that problem. Yeah, and then as to number as to number two, you know, on a on a, a a disposition where the defendant pled guilty, there there would have to be some kind of, you know, if there's some kind of a defect in the plea, then you're going to vacate the plea. But I can't see a defendant saying I pleaded guilty and the sentence was ex excessive. Well, that was a negotiated deal. I can't unless there's new new facts concerning his you know, coercion or something, and then that you send it back to the trial court. Uh, but the, the court is not on its own going to change the deal without hearing from everybody, and that's best done in the trial court. So I just don't see how that even well, look, come into look, play. I had a couple of thoughts and responses. First of all, in terms of the geographic disparities, we could always write the statute that says that that should be a consideration. So we could, well, we could figure that out. The second is, I mean, in New York, what is it? 7% of sentences are reduced. Is that about right, Tom? Yeah, something like that. It might be a little bit lower, but that's in the ballpark. All right, six to seven. So it's not a, a huge number. They are in plea cases. I agree it's a little bit awkward, Justice Marino, but I guess <laughs> that everybody, but 90 plus percent of cases are, you know, that's 7%, but almost all of those are pleas anyway. So the, the courts are doing it. Now, maybe that's the culture of New York, and this is this yeah. you know, conversation that we had before about law versus culture. Right. Um, I just find, as an appellate practitioner, I find it incredibly difficult and problematic, honestly, when judge when courts, and maybe it just is a cop out, honestly, that the appellate courts do this when they say, "I probably wouldn't have issued this sentence, but um, you know, my hands are tied." If if a judge yeah. isn't doesn't think a sentence is appropriate. And they said, you know, this is second, they second guess all the time on rules of law. Why can't they second guess on this? I don't see this as yeah. totally. I agree that the impact of six or 7% of criminal cases is not massive. I have a question, Tom, um, if we have any sense of because if they could happen with plea cases, and obviously there are fewer appeals from pleas, might this just, you know, swamp the appellate courts with appeals? Mm -hmm that otherwise wouldn't happen. Do you understand what, that question? Yes, I, no, I think that's that's a good question. I think the New York experience is helpful there too, because it's much easier to do an appeal. You don't need a certificate of probable cause. You just file the paper, you know, you, you sign the notice of appeal and, and proceed. Um, and I'm always surprised by how few people appeal their cases, even in trial cases. So I don't know what the disconnect there is sometimes, but if you look at those overall numbers, you'd expect every trial to be appealed and isn't necessarily the case. And I think that's even more true in guilty plea cases. So I think mm -hmm. the New York experience is just uh, instructive on that again, that um, sure, there'll probably be a few more appeals. And if there's a few more sentences that are at a court fines are excessive, that seems like a uh, reasonable cost to pay. Um, 
And I, and I think you're right, Justice Mourinho, even though the standard is technically doesn't distinguish between guilty plea and trial cases, I'm sure the practical ability to get a reduction in guilty plea case is a little bit harder for all those reasons. Yeah. But it, it does happen. And you just, um, you know, given the volume of, of cases uh, that go through the courts, just things can even a lawful sentence can go haywire. And I also remember when Judge Cousins was before the committee last year, he talked about, because um, there were questions about if you go back for second look sentencing in, under 1170B, should mm -hmm. it go back to the same judge or should we make yeah. sure it doesn't go back to the same judge? And he was very candid. He said, you know, you do a sentencing and then you, you move on and you sort of forget about it. And so I, I um, to me, that sort of worked into this idea where it's sort of like, there's no sense that just given the volume and the uh, number of cases to get through that it, I think the idea that there it would necessarily be in a sort of seen as um, demeaning or insulting to the trial court judges maybe is is not true just given given the volume of course there are going to be those cases that everyone remembers and loses sleep over but mm -hmm. the um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of cases too where even as a defense attorney, I would be hard pressed to remember what happened a, a week later sometime, just to be candid. Right. Might it um, also be uh, a check on trial judges to know that they're always being looked over their shoulder on these, whether or not? I, I think so. I, I think that also has some unintended consequences where like, well, you know, you can, it's almost defiant the other way where, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you, I've, I've seen cases, <laughs> I had a few cases in New York where the record was like, you can take this to 26th Street, which is where the appellate division was in Madison Square Garden or Madison Square Park and see what they have to say about it. So it almost uh, might be freeing sometimes. I think that's probably unusual. But yes, I do yeah. think that's the point of appellate review is there are sometimes things that go wrong below. And as Senator Skinner said earlier, no human process is going to be perfect. So uh, additional level of appropriate correction and a safety valve um, fits along with that idea. Right. But of course, this would to California's legal culture would seem like a shock. But yes. <laughs> other places do it and are okay. So I, I, you know, and I think maybe hearing from some of the judges in New York, who, you know, some of the presiding appellate division judges there. Um, I don't know, I think they would be surprised it would seem controversial. But I'm sure we could tell them something we do that they would, you know, blow right. their brains out too about. <laughs> yeah, well, so. What's going to happen though, even in the in a situation where there's no legal error, or misapplication of the rules or, or law, you're going to get this, you know, that the sentence is, ex is extensive. I mean, is, uh, yeah, is, is excessive. excessive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a kind of a throw, uh, that's a throwaway issue you have to have a basis uh, for it i mean the court's going to be inundated with kind of meritless appeals uh based on you know it was too much time that the judge imposed well there's got to be a basis for it and not just you know the appellate judges think that the sentence was excessive there has to be the appeal is there to correct legal error and, and not because the sentence is excessive, unless there's some kind of due process or constitutional you know, claim, it's not gonna go anywhere. And they're not gonna like all these appeals coming up without kind of a legal basis other than you know, too much time. And you hear that all the time. Uh, and then on a guilty plea, are they gonna set aside the deal? I, I just don't, anyway, I just think that we have bigger fish to fry than, than this this issue and there would be a lot of opposition uh, to it. I know we're dealing in an ideal world, but there'd be a lot of opposition. And, you know, the the trial courts as it is, you know, uh, resent the appellate courts uh, reversing them on, on the sentencing error. The sentencing statutes are very complex. So it's a minefield, uh, but to come up with this where there's no legal error and it's just too much time, that's even more of an insult to the trial court. I agree, it's a huge um, um, mind shift. And Justin Marino, I, I, I take with great, uh, I totally understand that appellate courts are completely unaccustomed to the idea of like, no legal, if there's no legal error, then there's no, no problem, it's not my job. 
we're talking about a proposal that would change that. Mm -hmm. So, right, so they would be forced to say, that's not sufficient. The fact that there's no legal errors saying, do I set things, and we could put in guideposts to say, is it excessive relative to sentences throughout the state for similar crimes or, you know, to try to do some of the geographic yeah. disparities, but you could have put in some, some guide lines in there, I suspect. I agree that it's not a tremendous amount of cases. I mean, we should, I just wonder kind of what would be five or 6% of appellate cases that shouldn't be hard to figure out in California. Um, and the reductions probably aren't that big, right? We're not talking about reducing from a million, you know, 10 years to one year, probably, I'm guessing, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, why not give a second pair of eyes to a, a sentence that, you know, two appellate judges think is excessive? One, one additional um information point, um, just a law like this might give incentive to collect data in the first place on sentencing of um, different offenses across California, which doesn't really happen in a collective way yet, um, but it's something we we would like to have happen. Um, well, are, are we other, doing that, Laura? Other, I mean, I, right here, I'm working on it, but only gotten a little bit, um, but I mean, other states do do that. I mean, we've talked to Virginia does that, Michigan does that, Minnesota does that, um, but we we don't do that. And um, they have different ways of t informing judges about what those average you know, sentences are and ways to kind of get judges in line sometimes when they're overreaching. But California really doesn't have that. Um, so it's just an, another, uh, maybe another tool that uh, could just make sure that there's not too harsh of sentences um, being meted out. Right. You know, they can come back with 120, within 120 days for resentencing, but it's gonna be before the same judge. You know, the one other little historical tidbit that might be um, relevant here is part of the shift to determinant sentencing was a big um, concern with disproportionality and disparate sentences in different parts of the state or in the same, you know, jurisdiction even. And when the DSL law was, was passed, it actually uh, gave the parole board, which had a different name back then, the power, and that, in fact, the obligation to review everybody who came to prison, look at their sentence and see if there are disparities. And that was part of what the 120-day uh, deadline was was part of Justice Mourinho. Was, they had longer time to do it, to go back for resentencing. Mm -hmm. And we actually did this for about 10 years where the uh, uh, sentencing review unit, as I think it was called, which still exists but does different stuff now, had a database of 75,000 sentences and would compare you in there, would control for you know different things in the case. And if you were, there was some cutoff, there was a mathematical cutoff. If you were, you know, if your sentence was higher than, you know, 85% of the other ones, you'd get sent back to court and there was questions about then what's the court supposed to do? So there was sort of this very formal, almost mechanical uh, sentence that's very review process for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or, or, or something um, that seems to have disappeared without a trace. You can only find a few places that acknowledge it. So there is some sort of um, recentish history in California for sort of uh, second guessing or trying to correct for disparities. But, um, you know, I think uh, it's a little bit harder to build in build it, that into the appellate process because, right, where does the data come from? What's the cutoff? How reliable is it? Are they really just reviewing based on numbers and not sort of exercising any of their own, you know, judicial instincts uh, when doing the review? So I think it'd be a little bit tricky, but we do have that um, experience of sort of formally reviewing every sentence for, for disparity in the, in the yeah. recent past. And this would sort of be a translation of that based on uh, the experience in a few other places. So I, have, I do have a question sort of dating, going back to what Laura was suggesting. Are we, as the committee, do we, are we getting a collection of sentencing data across the state? 
uh, we have the data that's being collected. Let me put it that way. Um, you know, so the rap sheet data that Steve and Mia talked about from the Department of Justice that will have the sentence, but it doesn't include a lot of the other information you want to know. You know, um, how just sort of more qualitative information. You know, what what uh, how. I keep wanting to say the word vicious, but that's not the right word, but things about the offense that aren't captured just in the length of the, of the sentence. And that's sort of the what these disparity reviews try to account for. Sometimes. I guess what I was trying to get to, I, I, I get that in every case, when you get down to the details, are right. unique, but to, I don't know if there's a model, Lara from Virginia or whatever the other states do collect this data in a, in a way that seems um, uh, rigorous or uh, adequate that could, instead of having a, an appellate review, go back to something more like Tom, along Tommy's line, say, first of all, collect the data, as you suggested, and make that a requirement. And then if a sentence falls outside of a standard of deviation, or just to throw out a mathematical term that I don't really quite mm -hmm. understand, um, that that triggers sort of the 1170D process. So that's know. interesting. I mean, that that um, that's a very heavy lift to you know put a sort of data collection apparatus and and have somebody review it. Um, I think that's great, but that's a you know um, that's sort of a exponential difference from this idea i think a little bit we're also 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 it's only dealing with the super outliers it's not dealing right. with professor ocean's point to the broader problem of over incarceration that would only address the super outlier sentences That's right. I, I love the idea of putting into um you know saying something about collecting data though um, because we really don't do that and we need to and we're hoping that this doj data will help us do that, but we haven't gotten that far to really know uh, if it will or not. Professor Ochin. Uh, I guess my, my question that just occurred to me is in what way does this recommendation, well, well, actually, as I'm thinking about it, it probably doesn't at all. I was thinking about the Racial Justice Act. Um, I know it's it only applies to a certain category of cases, um, but that is a, a second look, if you will, um, uh, of, of, certain, of, of certain cases for particular issues related to racial bias. And I'm wondering if, if that is instructive in any way um, with regard to you know, the broad set of cases that, that might be reviewed by appellate courts. I should know this, but I don't think the second look, the Racial Justice Act is a second look. I don't think it's retroactive. I think it's only right. um, at trial of your particular case. I don't think it's an appellate review or. Okay. Maybe I mean, I'm thinking of the North Carolina Racial Justice Act. Perhaps. Because I think that was a second look of uh, death penalty cases. Yes. that. The death penalty case is, was from North Carolina. And, be, and there was a bill this year to make the Racial Justice Act retroactive, but I don't think that that passed. Is that correct, Rick? Not yet. It's still uh, possible next year, from what I understand. Right, and that, and that would be a second look, in effect, um, on, uh, on the racial justice categories. I don't, it's not a geographic disparity or anything like that, but. Yeah, and, and that the burden of proof there is um, fairly rigorous. You know, you have to show to a statistical certainty, and you know, this is paraphrasing it that your sentence or your charge was um, has a causal link to race. Where this this idea about appellate review of the sentence is much more of a equitable power the courts would have without you know there needing to be burdens of proof and statistics and, and things like that. Definitely related, and I think the Racial Justice Act litigation will produce you know sort of a body of knowledge or, or data that that will be relevant in lots of other areas in, in court and this could certainly be one of them well unless anybody has other thoughts i i think i'm ready to move on i mean i do think that you know a couple of points i'll just conclude this would only address the big the far outliers because even if we were to 
uh, if this were to pass, I agree with Justice Moreno, there'd be a lot of reluctance to do it, only in the most extreme cases, and it would just have to be such an obvious sore thumb that they did it. Um, but perhaps that's reason enough and that the, for those people who have such incredibly disproportionate sentences, um, they should. But also, I understand we only have so many fish to fry and gunpowder to use or whatever the appropriate metaphor is. Um, but maybe we can crunch some numbers and, and see how, you know, back of the envelope, how many cases this might affect uh, in California before we dismiss it altogether. Right. Does anybody have any additional thoughts, questions, concerns? Nope. Nope. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, this is, Espinosa. I didn't see Yeah, you. this is Espinosa. I, I just want to follow up on your comment. We're going to be making a lot of recommendations, and this is this is going to be picking a fight in an area that I don't necessarily think is going to produce much in the way of um, reduce sentences. I just wonder if maybe we should put a pin in this till next year and focus on some of our other priorities, but that's just me. I just, knowing what I know about my former colleagues, it's just gonna raise a lot of eyebrows. And yeah, this is at the top of the list of, look what this commission did. <laughs> yeah. Not the death penalty or the hell <laughs> Yeah, there's, you know, those, those, have, those have currency. This, the you know, judges on both ends, the appellates and the trial judges are going to say, what are they thinking? Yeah. It's my thought. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, can we go to the next? Yeah, let's keep moving. All right, number six, county parole. So this came up, I think, at the committee meeting in July, where we uh, heard about Prop 57, this nonviolent parole process that we talked about a little bit earlier in the day. And the realization was made that there is no equivalent early release mechanism for people who are serving county jail sentences, people that but for realignment would be in um, state prison and would have some of these things available to them. Uh, but it turns out that there is something existing in the penal code already, which is this county parole law, which was enacted at least as uh, early as the 50s, but hasn't been uh, really updated since the late 70s. Um, that says in each county, there is a county, uh, there's a board of county parole commissioners and that county uh, board of parole commissioners right now is a representative from the sheriff, probation, and then the presiding judge of the superior court appoints somebody to it. And they have essentially total discretion to set their rules about eligibility, who's going to get out, what they're going to do when they're out, who supervises them. Uh, but anyone who's sentenced to a sentence in county jail um, is ostensibly uh, eligible for county parole. What we found in, in talking to a, a number of jurisdictions that, that do this is that almost nobody does it, including some of the bigger ones. Um, Los Angeles County, from folks we spoke with, don't uh, have this set up at all. Uh, it, it tended to be smaller jurisdictions uh, that did make use of county parole. The caseloads were very small. And what I heard, um, one, of, one of the other themes that we heard was that this just doesn't isn't available for people doing the AB 109 realigned sentences. So sort of the population that might make the most sense to folks who are doing longer sentences in jail, in many instances, there's um, a perception that I think is not correct based on the way the penal code is written now, but this isn't even available for them. Um, so I think the idea here is this is a, a tool that exists in the penal code. We could sort of dust it off perhaps put some new tires on it and make it a tool that counties could use uh, in the appropriate cases where they have some issues with how many people are in their jail or if they just think uh, more people should not be incarcerated and that supervision makes sense for more people. Um, so that that's the basic idea um, behind it. Um, you know, this also might be a little bit of a solution that's in search of a problem to a degree because it's been very hard, and I was really reminded of this when we heard from uh, the CPL folks this morning, knowing exactly what is going on in a sentence length sense in, in uh, the jails in California is, is challenging. There isn't sort of a, a main repository for data, like there is at least with CDCR. Um, some data I was able to get from the LA County Jail pre-COVID suggested there were, I think it was more than 2,000, maybe 2,400 people who were doing a sentence of more than a year. So, um, you know, if you do some rough back the envelope math and say that's about a third of the state, we're talking maybe at most the potential population here is a, a few thousand people. 
Um, but again, we just don't know. We don't know what those numbers are going to look like, uh, you know, even after the pandemic subsides a little bit. And this also runs into the fact that there is an existing sentence uh, system of split sentences where a court now can impose sort of a sentence that has a portion of incarceration in the jail and a portion of supervision. So how would this fit in to that? Um, but on the other hand, <laughs> to do a classic lawyer move, it does seem like there are people who are doing long county jail sentences and that they're just from a basic fairness point, there should be some opportunity for them to get early release as if they were in uh, state prison. That number may be small. It may not be worth our uh, fish fry oil or whatever metaphor we're using, but um, it seems like this idea is very uh, consonant with the ideas around the extending parole release um, eligibility that we spoke about this morning. And we could go through some of the ways we could sort of, you know, um, spruce this up for the uh, modern times, but I think that might be something we can, that could come out in discussion. Judge Espinoza, I see you have your hand up and have for a yeah. while. My apologies. Enthusiastically, <laughs> almost immediately. I think this is a great idea. Um, yes. in, a county, in a county that has uh, a brewing humanitarian crisis in its jail, particularly with the COVID surge, we're looking for ways to get people out to uh, uh, undo the overcrowding in the inmate reception center and just everywhere in the jail. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this existed. You're um, not alone. I've been, <laughs> I've been around LA County my whole life. It's certainly my whole legal career. I think there needs to be some way to bring this to everyone's attention. I like the idea that we, um, the last number four, everyone um, being confined in the jail be reviewed for county parole, at least as to the AB 109 population. And I've said this before. We did a town hall in the county jail a couple of years ago, and we met a woman who was doing 12 years in the county jail on a dope case. And it was it was horrifying when you know, particularly for the women at CRDF, the facilities and what's available and what's not. 12 years in the county jail needs to be reviewed by somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is an excellent, I don't know how we modernize it. I don't know how we you know, put new tires and dust it off as you've said, but I, I would love to see this come to the forefront as a tool for reducing the county jail population. I recognize that we are amongst a small number of counties that has an overcrowding problem, um, but I, I think this would be welcome in Los Angeles County for certain. And, and you know, it does remind me, Judge Espinosa, one thing I heard from a few people, including some folks in sheriff's departments was, in some counties, everybody gets along. Probation gets along with the sheriff and you know whoever is appointed by the um, presiding judge, but that's not necessarily true in every county. And that might be why um, there's some inability to use county parole because it does require some level of cooperation that might not be, um, that's easier in some places than others. And that's just, I'm just reporting what I've, what I've heard. Sure. I don't really have an opinion on, on that, but it seems perhaps yeah. relevant. I can only speak from my own experience in my in our county. We have excellent working relationships with sheriff's um, leadership, sheriff's personnel in charge of the jail, in charge of patrol. We are able to meet, and we do meet frequently. We don't meet much with the sheriff, he's kind of a busy guy, but we do meet with his, his administrative staff, his assistant sheriffs uh, on the issues that concern the work that we do. We have a great working relationship with the probation department. Um, particularly around the use of SB 678 funds. Mm -hmm. I just think, again, I'm just speaking from our, our experience. I recognize that political differences are more pronounced in some of the rural counties, perhaps, or counties that don't have the, the overcrowding problem that we have, but I just see this as a, it's a really excellent recommendation. Um, I want to weigh in also that I think that this is sort of in line with our earlier recommendations about equalizing the treatment of folks between jails and prisons um, and um, also encouraging parole, incentivizing rehabilitation, you know, it's in line with those uh, aspects of it. It's also, you know, very squarely within the, you know, mandate of the committee in that this is a completely unused, you know, statute on the books. Um, and um, so I and we were supposed to improve the system of probation and parole. That's in the statute too. So yeah, 
Um, I do think operationally, it's a little bit difficult to figure out how it would work, especially for very short sentences. Um, but um, I, I, I support as well. Yeah, uh, Senator Skinner. How many counties have parole boards? I, you know, I don't, I don't have a definitive number on that. What I can say is um, what I've seen from both uh, the big entities that, that would know would, would be CPOC and the Sheriff's Association. And at different times I've said almost no one uses this. And sort of when there's been bills that come up to the legislature about this, they'll write a letter saying almost no one is using county parole. And those things are a little out of date, but I have no reason to think that's that's different. Well, I, um, it sounds from the from our uh, judicial comments that it's working at least in LA County, but I don't know if it would work everywhere. I mean, when I think who appoints it, for example, I mean, if I take Alameda County, um, we're a large county, we, our, um, our uh, demographics are really different, um, meaning that our we have a concentration of Latino and uh, Black population in the uh, in the uh, western part of the county, and not in the eastern part of the county. Same in Contra Costa, and yet the um, it, anyway, if it depending on uh, but the criminal population, meaning the jail is primarily from those communities of the county that are in. Um, uh, you know, just in the western portions, not in the eastern portions. And depending on who appoints it and all, it could be, I, I'm not really sure if this is beneficial. So I, mean, I feel like we've not really had that thorough of a discussion or if we did, and I maybe missed stuff, maybe I know I missed some of our sessions in this last um, period of time over this year. Um, but I don't feel we've had really a thorough enough discussion on how a county's parole system might work, who would appoint it, what uh, guidance it would be given for me to be jumping to um, approve this particular recommendation at this point. Well, we have not I, had I, I agree. Uh, and I was just wondering. Uh, I'm assuming that there'd be a cost savings. I mean, parole being cheaper than incarceration. So that might be another uh, selling point. Although as Nancy points out, you know, how's this thing gonna work? How's it gonna be administered? And who's gonna front the bill? Are we gonna get money from the state? Or uh, how are the board of supervisors, uh, what their attitude is gonna be towards funding uh, something like this at the county level? So those are just comments. I just want to make sure that um, I was clear. We're not doing this in LA County oh, at yeah. all. Okay. We are not doing it. What I was suggesting though, is that we are doing so many other things in collaboration with probation and the sheriff's department and the superior court, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. our, all our court-based diversion programs are in collaboration with the court. I could see this being a very popular notion in Los Angeles County. And it sounds like the statute already names <laughs> <laughs> the commissioners it's the sheriff it's the, it's the sheriff it's chief probation officer or their designees and the presiding judge of the superior court or their designee and i <coughs> i just think this would be a popular notion in los angeles county unless i'm missing something huge so um, because you, we are battling over crowding right do you see it as i guess maybe i'm trying to understand it better is is it would it work for you something like um the ability for courts to have more access to probation and diversion than a jail sentence, for example? I'm not sure that I understand that, but I think I think it would be it would be used to. I don't see it being used a lot for people who are serving a year or less in the county jail. I just don't. We don't we don't hold people very long in our jail because of the overcrowding problems. So if you get a a one-year sentence on a, on a felony, uh, 
probation grant, you might do 10% of that. Um, however, if you get five years on a realignment sentence, you do every minute of that, you know, minus your, your conduct credits, you're going to be in the county jail for a long time. And I think there will be some political will to take a look at how to reduce the, the, uh, the AB 109 population in the jail. It's a significant growing percentage of the people that we're holding. Um, at least it was pre-COVID. I haven't, I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but it's not a, it's not a small number in our county. It's a, it's a lot of folks. And I'll just add, and then I'll go to Professor Ochin, that LA is not alone. Over 20 counties have are under some sort of core overcrowding, again, pre-COVID, uh, overcrowding uh, lawsuit or uh, court order. Uh, yes, Professor Ochin. Yeah, I just want to uh, agree um, with Judge Espinoza. I think that we should approve this uh, recommendation for many of the reasons that he said. Obviously, the sheriff already has um, legal authority to release people um, uh, as a result of overcrowding. But again, that's usually for folks who are uh, serving uh, misdemeanors um, uh, or you know lower level uh, offenses. So I think this would um, go a long way in terms of addressing those folks who are serving realignment sentences for long periods of time in our jails, which were not, were not designed uh, to hold people long-term in the ways that they're being used uh, right now. Um, so, so I think this is a, even if we still have to work out the details, I think it's um, one, calling attention to the fact that this does exist. They are authorized by current law um, that we should be investigating why they aren't being used more broadly and encourage folks uh, to the extent, or encourage counties to the extent that they're not using them now um, to invest in constituting these uh, county parole boards. I also like it to the extent that so much of the problem of uh, over incarceration isn't the extreme sentences like LWAP that draw so much attention, but it's the churn of people throughout the county jails that often don't get enough attention. I'm not saying that this necessarily solves that problem. It hardly, you know, certainly doesn't address the whole problem, but I'm, you know, keep on being struck by the hundreds of thousands of people who are annually booked into county jails in California every year and how little, how difficult that population is to um, address in terms of um, our legal system. So I, I like whether this proposal or not, that, it, that our committee you know, focuses on this population a little bit more. I, did, I would just wanna say one final thing, Senator Skinner, it might be a, Part of the process where the legislature offers up some pilot programs in in a small number of counties through the BSCC to fund um, a few of these pro boards to see if they work. I mean, I've, I've seen the BSCC be successful in launching, for example, the lead pilots in San Francisco and LA. And I just, I don't know, I don't, this just really appeals to me. It seems to me there'll be a way to to increase its value. Okay. I just may need to uh, uh, understand it a little more and um, and uh, you know talk to staff about it. I may be responding more to, for example, the state full board's very low rates of. Um, uh, you know, we've increased the number of people, we've increased the ability for you to get before the parole board. So we've way increased the number of hearings that the parole board has, and yet we have not uh, succeeded at all in increasing the rate of um, approvals for parole. And so I may be reacting or responding to that and applying it to a new system across the state and everything. I, I agree. That's an excellent point. And we will address that is that somehow address a, a standard that would make it be effect, effective to, to, to accomplish, you know, what we want. Um, so I certainly agree with that. Uh, any other comments on this um, proposal? Next. 